Good morning. I am so thankful that I get to be the first one to talk to you in 2010. I think it's a great privilege and honor that I get to be up here. And uh, Doris, thank you for picking out the song. She asked me last week, uh, what songs would you like to sing? And I, I was going to say Mary Had a Little Lamb, because <laughs> that's about the extent of my song knowledge. I'm embarrassed to say I don't even know the instrument that, that Aaron plays, and it was beautiful. Whatever it, it's called, she did a great job. And <laughs> cello, okay, thank you. Uh, but I, <laughs> thank you, Doris, for the songs. You picked out wonderful songs. Um, let me begin us in prayer this morning. God, I pray that you would just calm my nerves. I'm just I'm bubbling over with excitement this morning. God, I just pray that you would uh, you'd use me this morning, Lord, that you'd speak the words through me, and Lord, that the things that I would say this morning would land on the hearts of the people that are here listening. God, I pray that you'd soften our hearts, Lord, that, that we could not help but come out of here changed people because of the words that we hear. God, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to do your thing this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Now, if you want to follow along today, uh, I'm going to be in Genesis 3 for most of the first part of the service. Uh, if so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and just turn there. Uh, then I'm going to jump to Isaiah 53, then I'll be in Romans 3, and then I'm going to end in Revelation. So I, I, I can't help get up, but get up here and be kind of like the Bible auction man. I'm, I'm going to be all over the place. But if you're going to try to follow along, that's where I'm going to follow along. And I, I do encourage you to bring your Bible. Uh, and technology is a wonderful thing. We have these words up here. But you can't take the screen home with you. So please bring a Bible, because uh, you can take that home with you, and you can reread what we talk about. Um, today we're talking about atonement, and uh, I think it's an appropriate topic given the fact that we just got done celebrating our Savior's birth. We, we're mo now moving towards our Easter celebration, and I think atonement follows really well behind the birth of our Savior. Um, if, uh, if you ask me, what is the Bible about? If, if anybody would ask me that, I think I would sum it up with one word, and it would be this, atonement. I think atonement is the big story among all the little stories. I think everything in the Bible points to the atonement. I don't think you can pick up the Bible and not see the atonement in just about every story that you read. Now, the Gospels, granted, four Gospels, most of the Gospels are written about Jesus' death and His resurrection and the atoning work of Christ. I'm not even really going to touch the Gospels today, uh, believe it or not. Although atonement is a big part of the Gospels, I believe it is from Genesis to Revelation. You're going to find the story of atonement everywhere. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the whole Bible pretty much this morning. Um, I stole a book out of Stewart's library, and I, I would encourage you to steal books from your pastors. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> they have good books on their shelves. Uh, I, I took a systematic theology book, and he has a definition uh, by, written by Wayne Grudem. Uh, and I really like this definition. Of all the definitions I came across and studied, th this one captured something that the others didn't. It says here, the work Christ did in life and death to earn our salvation. That's, that's Wayne Grudem's definition of atonement. And what I think it captures here is the fact that it's not just Jesus' death on the cross that captured atonement. He says here, Christ did in life. His whole life was an atoning life. There was nothing about our Savior that wasn't for atonement. He was our perfect law-bearing Savior. I think that's important. I think he really captured it. If you're really looking for just a quick dude definition, if somebody wanted to, if you want to impress somebody, atonement really means at one, to become at one with something. In this case, at one with God. Uh, atonement's not usually a word we use in our vocabulary. You know, when my, my kids are doing something wrong in, how, in the house, I don't say, hey, go make atonement with your sister or your brother. It's not, it's not a common expression. And, and I think that's probably a good thing that we don't use it as a common expression because I think atonement has much more meaning. It's much more, it's deeper than just saying, hey, go say you're sorry. You know, it is a re restoring a friendship. It's restoring a relationship. That is what atonement is about. But it, you really can't compare it to human atonement or human friendship and relationship. The friendship that we have with God, it's, it's much deeper than that. And I'm hoping to show you that this morning. Like most sermons, I, I like to, the doctrine of repeatability. If you've never heard that before, I, it's, it's not a word. It's something I made up. Uh, but the idea is this, is if, if it's repeated in the Bible, it's important usually. I, I think repetition is a good thing. Whenever we want to become good at a sport, we repeat what we're doing. We practice hard, and repetition makes us good. Uh, when we're trying to teach our kids something, we repeat ourselves over and over. 
and over again, painfully. But anyhow, the Bible repeats itself. It uses the word blood 382 times. It uses the word atonement 93 times. And in the same sentence, atonement and blood are found 11 times. Now, that seems like a low number, right? 11 times. Well, it kind of is a low number, but I want you to realize every time atonement is mentioned in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily say the word atonement. And every time that the shedding of blood occurs, it doesn't actually use the word blood. So 11 is kind of a misleading number. It's implied everywhere. Atonement is throughout the Bible. Is the Bible a bloody book? And I'm not using that as a British curse word. It, 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 I, I think it's kind of funny. I, if, if you've never walked into a church before and you come in and you've, and you've never heard about the, the salvation that Christ has offered us, I think the Bible is a very bloody book. I think, you know, how, how strange it must sound to the pure ears that come in here and you were singing songs about being washed in the blood. I mean, can you imagine what that sounds like to, to somebody that's never heard of the gospel or the message of Christ at all? I, I think it's kind of interesting uh, that, that we do make such a big deal of blood. I think blood is a great thing. I know I'm going to lose my place because I'm so excited, so just bear with me if I get lost looking at my notes here for a second. So, why blood? Uh, I think Leviticus probably nails it the most. I, this is probably the most concise definition I think the Bible gives us of what atonement is. It says here in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. That's probably the, the most concise definition that you will find in Scripture. And, I th you know, it tells you here, blood is critical. It is the life force within an animal. It's the life force within us. You cannot survive without blood. If you bleed out, you will die. Now, this is from the Passion of Christ, if any of you have not seen it. Uh, I'm not ruining the story here, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think our society kind of has a blood phobia. I, I think we don't talk about blood that often. I, I think... When this movie came out, it was a real indication of that. If you read what the critics said, they were really beating up Mel Gibson about saying, oh, this movie, it's too bloody. You know, I, I don't agree with that, but I, I, I do agree with the fact that they said, yeah, they made it, Mel Gibson kind of made it horrific, and it was horrendous. He compared it to, like, a horror film. Well, we call horror films horror films because they're bloody. You know, that, that is appropriate. And in a sense, this was bloody. It was very horrific what we saw. And I, I think the blood phobia, I think it's kind of a neat phenomenon that we have. Most of us will cringe at the sight of blood. This is a natural feeling. You know, you, you just, it's just not normal to just go see something get stuck and then blood spurt out and, and you not cringe or make a face. And I, I think there, that's a design feature. I really think God intended for us to feel that way. I think we are supposed to feel kind of sick when we see the sight of blood. So if you feel faint at the sight of blood, don't don't be upset. I think that's how you were designed. And I think there's a reason. If blood is for atonement, and atonement is for our sins, then blood should make us sick. Because you think about it, if, if blood troubles you, then sin should trouble you. If, if blood makes you sick, sin should make you sicker. If anything, blood should show us how serious God was about sin in the first place. So, John Owen said it this way. He's a great evangelist of 18th century, I think. Uh, he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. I think that's a, a great way to put it. We can't be at peace with our sin. I think with most phobias, I don't know, you can overcome them. You can get to the point where you're comfortable with them. You know, so you can, you, good news is if you're afraid of blood, you can overcome it. You can get to the point where it doesn't bother you anymore. You get around it enough. You see it, it doesn't disturb you. Well, I don't think sin should ever stop disturbing us. I don't think we should ever make peace with our sin. I think too many of us, we approach sin very casually. There's almost like this attitude like, you sin, I sin, we all sin a little bit. No, it's very serious. It's so serious that somebody had to bleed and die for us. So I, I think part of the problem with the church is we don't recognize that there's, there's a, a real war going on. We should not be at peace with our sin. If you walk into a paintball battle, you're probably going to recognize it pretty soon. You're going to get shot up. Or if you're from Kentucky, like Nancy Sweet, 
you walk into a corn cob field and somebody's having a corn cob battle, you're going to know it. Those corn cobs hurt. They start to fly in. Um, so I think part of the fact, we Christians, we need to just recognize we are in a war. We need to, do, we need to wage war against our sin. We can't treat it casually. You think God treated it casually by shedding the blood of his own son? All right, Genesis, if you got your Bible open. We're going to start here in verse, verse 21. So the story of atonement doesn't just start in the Gospels. It doesn't end with Jesus' death on the cross. The very first time we see the story of atonement pick up is right here. Verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and, and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Now you're saying to yourself, what does that have to do with atonement? Well, it has a lot to do with atonement. You think about it. Here's the first sin ever committed on earth. The first time we've fallen away from God's grace. We're, we have Adam and Eve in paradise. We're in, in God's presence, walking with, with Him, the Creator, right there. And what a blessing. What an incredible thing that is. And then we have the first sin. And what does God do? I don't know about you, but I don't know of an animal that likes you wearing its skin while it's still alive. Something had to die. At the very first sin, there was an act of bloodshed. And look whose hands did it. God did it, right from the very beginning. He was planting a seed, even from the very first act of, of sin, the very first time anyone had ever committed anything wrong, blood occurred. And imagine how Adam and Eve must have felt. They had been given dominion over all the animals. They named all the animals. So whatever animal God had chose to sacrifice that day, it must have disturbed them. Think of how horrific the first time bloodshed occurred, the first time an animal had been destroyed before human eyes. How horrendous that must have made them feel. Think about how they must have looked at sin from that point on, how serious they must have taken it. When God said not to do something, it was very serious. They saw blood, and it meant something. But we also have something else in that same verse in chapter 3. If you back up a couple verses, verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Again, God right here, He declares there's a war going on. There is an adversary. All right. Then He says, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Notice the word he here. This offspring of Adam and Eve. Who's this offspring? This is Jesus. This is the first gospel promise. This is, I can never pronounce it, it's like proto-evangelion, I guess is what the scholars call it. But it's, it's basically saying, God is promising you there's going to be a Savior. Here we are, the first act of sin, the first sight of bloodshed, and God is promising a Savior right here from the beginning, from the onset. Atonement, the story of atonement has begun. You're in Genesis, and you see atonement. You go on through the Bible, and you see Abel. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and out of, and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. I notice here, firstborn of his flock, Jesus was the firstborn of his father. And God had regard for his son's sacrifice. Just as Abel was regarded well, God had regard for Jesus. Then we go further in the book of Genesis. We get to chapter 8, verse 20. Noah had just been, he had just, his life had just been spared. What do you do when your life's just been spared? When God spares your life, Noah, he built an altar to the Lord, and he took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. We're not out of the book of Genesis. And think about how much has been killed. It's how much bloodshed has occurred already. Now, there's countless examples of, of animal sacrifices. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's countless, countless examples of them. Then you get to Job. Don't turn to Job. It's the only verse I'm going to use. Uh, he would rise early in the morning, offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did continually. Job every day would would sacrifice an animal for his children's sins. Not even his own sins. He was doing it. I don't know about you, but I'd run out of animals for my own kids. So I'm glad we don't do this anymore. I know some of you parents know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, so what was God doing? You know, it's kind of primitive. You know, he's killing all these animals. There's bloodshed all the time. Everybody's 
you know, killing animals for the provision of sin, what was he doing? And this is what I think it is. There's a pattern of understanding that he was planning in the, in the minds of humanity at this point in history. I think he, there's this word vicarious atonement. We use this word vicarious. We think about it, I live vicariously through my kids. Well, it's the idea you're living through something else. You're vicariously living through the blood of Christ. And I think that's what he's doing with the animals. He's, he's teaching this idea of something vicariously taking your sins away. There's really two big stories uh, in the Old Testament I'm going to focus on. Uh, one is Abraham and Isaac, the other is Moses and the Passover. These are, these are to me, these are the, the big two because they're the most, uh, they give us a glimpse of what the Savior is going to be for us. I think out of all the Old Testament passages, these just speak volumes. There, there's overtones and themes of the Savior and the work that He's going to be doing for us. First, we start with Isaac. And we're in 21, verse 2 in Genesis, if you're following. It says, And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham his old, in his old age. Uh, Isaac had a miraculous birth. Our Savior, we just celebrated, had a very miraculous birth. This is before the days of Cialis and all other kinds of wonder drugs. Uh, can you imagine going to your grandparents' house and one of your grandparents having a baby? That's miraculous. That's, that's a miracle. Uh, verse 2, he said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Both sons were only sons. Both sons were beloved sons by their father. Then he says, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, this is an interesting fact that, I, that I'd missed, uh, but eventually I read the right material and wised up to it. When... Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed on a hillside. Hundreds of years later, that same place, Mount Moriah, is the same place they built a temple. It is also the same place that the Jews called Jerusalem. That same hillside that Isaac was to be sacrificed on is the same hillside Jesus was sacrificed on. I find that very interesting. Then we go to verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. I find it very interesting that our Savior carried his own wood as Isaac carried his own wood to be sacrificed. Then we get to verse 12. I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son. Both fathers were willing to commit the ultimate and let their son be sacrificed. Now, Initially, I used to be confused by Abraham and Isaac. I, I, I used to think, wow, this is really sadistic for God to just take his son up there or tell this guy to go up there and butcher his son. I could not do that. That is not the kind of love I have for, for God. But if you notice, Abraham, I'm not going to read it to you, but if you read the story prior to him even walking up that hill, he turned to his servant that he was walking with, that had the donkey, and he said, both me and my son will return. Abraham knew the promises of God. He knew if he had sacrificed Isaac that some way Isaac was going to come back to life. And he was not willing to withhold that. He was willing to strike his son down because he knew the promises of God. He knew his son was coming down because God had promised a Savior through his lineage. Isaac was the only son that Abraham knew or had. So he knew. That's the kind of faith that he had. He knew that his son was going to come back alive. So if if you think this is kind of sick and twisted that Abraham was willing to do this, remember, Abraham had the knowledge and the trust in God to know that his son would not stay on that altar dead. But he didn't withhold it either. He went through with it. Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. For the first time we see a substitute, a replacement. Isaac is on the altar about to be sacrificed and God sees that he's not going to withhold his sacrifice. And he says, I will provide a replacement for you. I will provide a ram. Just as God provided a substitute for Abraham, he provides a substitute for us. He provides Jesus as our replacement. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God is the ultimate provider. And then we get to Passover. 
if you don't know your Bible very well, I'll explain a little bit. Moses uh, and the people of Israel are, are captives to the Egyptians. And all these plagues come, and they're getting to the end, and Pharaoh is weakening. He's starting to, he's starting to get to the point where you know, things are going bad for him. But then he hardens his heart one last time. And uh, Moses said, well, the last plague is going to be from your own lips. And Pharaoh explodes, and he says, the last one will, I'm going to kill the firstborn of every one of your children, is what Pharaoh says. Well, instead of the Israelites' firstborn dying, it ended up being Pharaoh's. Because as, as the events followed and as things unfolded, the Lord provided what is called the Passover. And we see here in Exodus, uh, verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male. Who does that sound like? Jesus was without blemish. I told you earlier, he, was, he led an atoning life. He was without sin. He knew no sin. Yet he took the penalty of sin. He was without blemish. So they took the lamb and they killed their lambs at twilight. And then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I see the blood. I will pass over you. And no, and no plague will befall you to destroy you. What a Savior. Passes over us. You are either under the blood of Christ or you will face God's wrath on your own. And He will get His blood one way or the other. It's either out of Jesus or it's out of you. All right, so this Passover meal, they celebrated it for history for thousands of years. And then we get up to the time of Jesus. And Jesus, on the night before He is to be killed, on the Last Supper, He was celebrating the Passover meal. And now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Jesus took thousands of years of history and redefined it in one night. We now call this the Last Supper. We first started with the, with the Passover meal. Now we get to Jesus, and now we call it the Last Supper. And He said in the same time, He said, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's pretty clear what God was doing with blood, isn't it? It's pretty clear through history what God was doing with blood. Now, I'm not ready to leave the Old Testament yet. Uh, I, I find it very interesting that we don't talk about Leviticus. I, and I know this is not a, a book we quote from. We don't get up in the morning and say, man, I'm going to get me some Leviticus today. It is, it is not something we quote. But at the same time, I think there's something very important there that we're missing if we don't talk about it. So Leviticus and Deuteronomy is the, the Old Testament law. It's, it's what they were told, this is how you can make your sacrifices to God. This is what you can and can't do. And this is how it's done. So Leviticus 1 through 7, this is basically the process. I kind of summed it up in a nutshell, seven, ch seven chapters for you for, for one type of offering. You, basically, you get an animal. Well, the animal usually in this time frame was expensive. Animals were, were, they didn't really have currency like we have now. The animals were the currency. So they were very precious. They were very expensive. A lot of times these animals would be, they would be like household pets to the kids. The, the, the kids would see these animals born into the family from their flock and raise the animal. They probably gave it a name even. Uh, and then they would take it and then the, take it to the priest. And then they would have this ceremony and they would have this laying on of hands and confession of sin. And what they were basically doing is they were transferring their sin to the animal, this precious animal without blemish. And then the priest would slit the throat and he would remind the family again that this precious animal, this blood is being shed for the sins that you have committed. And then he would take the blood and he would go into this place called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And there was this seat called the mercy seat. And he would take the blood and he would sprinkle the blood all over the mercy seat. This is one type. Then you have, this is the biggest of all the Days of Atonement. All the offerings and all the sacrifices, this is the biggest. This is the one the Jews, this was done annually. Uh, they would come up and the priests would confess. Uh, and then they would take a young bull and they would, they would slaughter that young bull. And it would be kind of funny. You'd come into church and basically the pastor would be up here and all the deacons would be up here. And we would basically tell our sins to the congregation. We would confess what we've been doing wrong all year long. 
and then we'd slaughter a young bull in front of everybody. It's kind of a strange act. And then the priest would sacrifice a goat. They would take a goat and they would do the same kind of things. They would lay their hands on the goat. And this time it was for the people. They would, they would sacrifice that goat for the people and they would take again the blood and they would go in and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then they would take another goat. And this is where it kind of, it's a little bit different. They would take a live goat uh, and they would lay hands on it and uh, they would release this goat into the wilderness. And this was kind of, this is where our term the scapegoat comes from. If you've ever heard that term, this is where it comes out. It's Leviticus 16. And what it basically is saying, they would take their sins, put it on this goat, and the goat would be left to wander the wilderness. And it was a symbol of how sin has now left the people and is out and wandering into the wilderness. So that's, that's the Old Testament. Very bloody. Now, I mean, these, these events were, you know, can you imagine coming into church and, and seeing blood all over the place? I bet the attendance would probably go down. I, I suspect. You know, it's, you know, you come up here and you see the priest and he's covered in blood. You know, it's dripping all over the place. It, is, it was a horrific sight. That same time, during the same Old Testament period, we have a prophet named Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, if you've ever read the book of Isaiah, I just go to 53. This book, this chapter is written 400 years prior to Jesus ever even being born. And look what Isaiah says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Notice he doesn't say, upon the animal, upon this sacrifice, upon this young bull, upon this goat. This is 400 years before Jesus even existed. God is saying, I have a Savior coming. He reveals it to Isaiah. Isaiah writes about the Savior in 53. It's one of the most powerful passages that you can read in the Bible. Again, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What a powerful message. Here it is in the Old Testament. During the sacrificial system, Isaiah is writing about the Savior. <laughs> So why did God offer a son? <clears throat> why, why Jesus? Why not the animals? Why not keep doing the animals? Well, the animals were insufficient. They, they had to keep doing it. They did it every year. They kept destroying animals and slaughtering. And it really didn't pay for the price of sin. They, they couldn't be the unblemished, perfect sacrifice that our Savior was. They couldn't accomplish what Jesus could do on the cross. And I think Paul tries to capture that in, in Romans chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now the word justified, <laughs> I almost said justified. Um, <laughs> justified, it, it's, it's a word that we commonly use in law. It's the language of law. It's, it's the idea of you stand condemned in a court of law. Where you stand, you are condemned. You can't do anything for yourself. You are a sinner. There is there's sin upon us from birth. No one has gone through life without sin. And we're all standing condemned where we stand. But Jesus pardons us. And then there's this beautiful word, redemption. Redemption is the idea, this is, a, this is the language of commerce. We use this as the idea that you, know, you, you pay for something, you receive some goods. Well, this, in this case, Paul is saying, yeah, something was paid for. It was paid for in blood. It was redeemed at the highest cost possible. You can't put a price any higher than that of blood sacrifice. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Propitiation, this is a fun word. I, we use big words here at Hope. We want you to feel like you got your money's worth when you come. So propitiation, I, well, I, I first time I heard that word, I thought, wow, Jesus was a pro pitcher, right? He must have played for the girded loins or something. But uh, <laughs> propitiation is a funny word. I'll explain it to you. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, in the, in the pagan days, there was this idea that, that the gods were all very bitter and that somehow you had to appease the gods. Uh, and, and the bigger your sacrifice, the more appeasement that you gave the gods. This is gods with a little g. Now, 
Christian propitiation is not the same way. It, it, it's not like God's the bitter old man up in the sky waiting for a sacrifice. It's not the same thing. He didn't ask yourself to be on an altar. He didn't ask you to sacrifice your own children. He appeased his own wrath. He put his own son out and put his own neck on the line so that we might be right with him again. Propitiation is the wrath being quenched in Jesus. It is the wrath that we deserve as sinners being quenched in Christ on the cross. God will always punish sin. He will either punish it in Jesus or He will punish it on you on your way to hell. It will always be punished. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. Here it is again. Paul recognizes the Passover meal. He recognizes the blood of Christ. The fact that God will pass over you if you're under the blood. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, John Piper wrote a sermon called, it was entitled, uh, Did God Die for Us or for God? And I thought, well, that, that's a very interesting question. You know, well, we know he died for us. I mean, that's pretty evident, you know. He died for God? What are you, what are you talking about? Well, the essence of his sermon was basically this, that there was something really big at stake for God in all this. The fact that you can't call yourself a just God and not leave sin unpunished. You have to punish sin. Jesus was solving one of the greatest problems, not only just the fact that he was restoring a relationship with us, the fact that he was upholding God's righteous name. His namesake was at stake here. Jesus solved a huge problem for God and the fact that his very name, His very justice was being served right here. God had to punish sin. He cannot leave it unpunished. You can't be a just God and leave sin unpunished. So that's what Jesus was doing. He was dying not only for us, but His Father as well. He was upholding that righteous name. Now we get to Revelation. I'm almost done if you're watching your clock, which you shouldn't be doing. Uh, so <laughs> Revelation, we get to the end here. He says, you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God, every tribe and language and people and nation. Now, it doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter your nationality. It's always the same thing. When you get to the book of Revelation, we start it in Genesis. We start in the garden. The story of atonement was there. We we get to the end, we're in the book of Revelation, the story of atonement is there. And guess what it is? It's still the same thing. By your blood, you ransom people for God. And every tribe and every language, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter where you're from or who you are, it's always going to be the blood that, that saves us. I love listening to Kimmy's accent, or anybody's accent really for that matter, because it reminds me that we all have the same common purpose. We all have the co same common Savior. It doesn't matter where we're from. Now finally we're at the final Passover meal. Even though this says a marriage supper. It says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now we start it with Passover. Then we get to the night of Jesus' death and it's the Last Supper. And now we get to the final meal. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb, which I really like to think of it as it's the final Passover meal. It, there's an invitation at the table. It says, blessed are those who are invited. Who's invited? All of us. We're all invited. I know my seat's going to be there. Will you have a seat at the table? Will you be able to sit at the Lamb? Well, if you're not sure, if you're not really sure how your invitation, what it's about, Revelation says this, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Now if you remember back in the, the book of Genesis in Adam and Eve, there was a tree of life and the gates were shut on them. They committed the sin. They were kicked out of the garden. The gates are shut. Now we're at the end of the book. We're at the end of the story. And guess what? The gates are open. You're walking in the presence of the tree of life. That tree of life drops out of the Bible in Genesis. It doesn't come back until Revelations. It falls out of the Bible and comes back here in Revelation. 
And you're now in the presence of this tree of life. How are you in the presence of this tree of life? It says it right here. Wash their robes. Well, what are the robes washed in? Genesis or Revelation says this in a previous chapter. It says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You can't get your invitation without the blood of the Lamb. You either put your faith in Jesus' blood or you put it in yourself. Are you going to be there? Are you going to be wearing the same robe that I'm wearing? Now, I'm going to leave you with a couple quotes. Some things I came across. Max Lucado said this. He said, The death of Jesus shows exactly how far God will go to become our friends with us again. I mean, you can't prove your friendship any more than what Christ already has done on the cross. You can't, you can't demonstrate it anymore. I believe that if the cross is understood rightly, it does not encourage us to be passive. You cannot look at the blood of Christ and be a passive Christian. It doesn't call for that. I've never met anybody that hasn't been gripped by the cross, that hasn't given their life away in the service of some way or another. Now, <laughs> it's a pretty amazing thing. A year ago today, I was preaching the first sermon I've ever preached, just about. It was right around Super Bowl last year, and this is my fourth sermon, if you're new here. It's only the fourth time I've done this. And I, it's an amazing thing to me to think that, that God's even brought me this far. The fact that, yeah, I'm, I'm not in occupational ministry. I'm not paid to be up here to preach to you. But I am in the life ministry of the service of the King. I have given my life to the Savior. And the same, you know, if you want to know why people aren't serving, well, I think the reason is very clear. They don't understand the cross. If you look around and you say to yourself, well, why aren't people serving? Why aren't people stepping up and doing things? Well, I don't think they've, they've understood the message of the cross. I don't think they've really truly heard the blood of the Savior. I don't think they know it. C.T. Studd said this. He said, if Jesus Christ is God and sacrificed his life for me, then no sacrifice I make will be too great for him. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He says, It is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. We are to be living sacrifices for Him. There is nothing about the Savior that causes us to be passive. We should look at this and, and realize that God is not casual about sin. We should wage war against our sin. It should, you know, I have people ask me the question, well, how do I know I have God's righteousness on me? How do I know I'm a Christian? How do I even know I'm saved? Well, how do you know you're alive? You don't need a birth certificate. You don't need vital records to tell you you're alive. You, you know you're alive because you're functioning, you're breathing, you're talking, you're speaking. Well, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, you hunger for the things of God. You're alive in Christ. You're alive for spiritual things. If you don't know what that feeling's like, then you probably aren't a Christian. Let's just be real. You probably aren't under the blood if you don't know what that's like. If you don't crave spiritual things... You may not be in a place where you belong right now. And you might need to give serious thought to the, to the blood and the atonement of Christ today. We're going to have an invitation up here. We're basically, Baptists, we're kind of funny. We, we like to you to come up here and make it public that, that you have received Christ, that you have decided that today is the day that you want to seriously consider what the atonement means for you. Now, I, you know, I'm not necessarily comfortable myself with that, you know, so if you don't want to come, that's fine. If you want to come up privately, that's fine. But we do have an altar up here open for you. If you want to come up and join our church, today you've decided that somehow that this is the place you want to be, and this is where you want to worship. That's also here for you today. Uh, but more than anything, I, I, I want you to be at the marriage supper with Christ. I want you to join me at that final Passover meal. I want you to have a seat at the table. If there's nothing you've heard this morning, that the story of the atonement will bring you, that blood will get you a seat at the table if you put your faith in it. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your son, and I thank you for the atoning work of your Savior. God, I, I never feel like I've said enough. Um, God, I know there's much more that I could have said, and I know there's much more uh, to it than, than what has already been said. Um, but God, I just pray that if there is anyone here whose heart has been softened, or if, Lord, if somebody's wrestling with this atoning work of your Savior, God, that, that, that it would just eat away at them, that they would not be able to leave this place and go out into this world and be the same person. God, that they would, they would want to know more about this Savior, about this atoning 
sacrificial love that has been demonstrated on the cross for us. God, I just pray for your blessings on this church. I pray for your blessings on our pastor as he is away. I pray that this is a time for him that he is just being energized. And Lord, that you will come back and he will have a passion uh, like we have never seen in him before. God, I, we, just, we just pray for your blessings over our church, knowing full well we don't deserve the blessings we already have. God, just, just come in here today and just work and do 